All right, I would like to move uh, to our next speaker. She has come from Greenville. Uh, this is uh, Ms. Tamisha Grant. If you would come up and grab a seat next to me here, we're gonna do a little sit down chat. Uh, Tamisha is the newly elected co-chair of the Single Parents Caucus. Now, last month I talked to you about joining a caucus of special interests in the South Carolina Democratic Party. There's, there's two dozen of them. There's plenty to choose from on any topic that you're particularly passionate about. And to help with that theme, we have two caucus chairs joining us. And we're going to start with Tamisha. She is, again, the co-chair of the Single Parents Caucus. She's lived in the upstate for 20 years. Uh, like me, she has migrated south from New York. She has worked in South Carolina politics for the last five years. She is passionate about uh, parental advocacy because of her beautiful young boy you see here videoing us right now. She is also currently the second vice president of the Democratic Women of Greenville County. Hello, Elijah. Are you filming everything? I was named after the Bible. Yes, you were. It's a good, strong name. <laughs> you know what? You're going to be on our interview list next. Tamisha is currently, or is formerly, the Chair of Communications for the Greenville Democratic Black Caucus and the Public Pu Policy Committee Chair for the National Council of Negro Women Greenville Chapter. Tamisha puts the word act in activism. I, I, I don't know if you can remember a time you weren't involved in a campaign. If you would grab the microphone from up in the stand, as you said, there, you can chat next to each other. There you go. So I learned that you were born in Brooklyn, New York. Yes. How did you end up in South Carolina? You're, you're out, you're, you get lost? No, 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 no. So um, my family has roots in Oconee County. Uh, my grandmother uh, was born and raised in Oconee County, uh, the Brazil family, for those that have family out there. Um, and when she retired, she was a teacher for 30 years. She was... Um, a kindergarten teacher and when she retired she said I'm going back home and my daddy said not without me <laughs> so we packed up our U-Haul and all of us all five of the children and my him and my mother decided that we were going to move to South Carolina and I've been here on and off pretty much ever since you know it's, it's interesting just the the paths our lives take and you never can predict where you're going to end up and what you're going to end up no. doing. So, so tell me how you got involved in the world of politics. You know, an educated, smart person can do anything, but you chose to get involved in the world of politics. Why would you do that to yourself? Crazy. Um, no, so um, y'all are, y'all are witnessing one of the main reasons. So um, I came back to South Carolina when I got pregnant with my son. I was formerly in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I wanted to be closer to my family. And um, when I got my degree, which is in psychology, I wound up in nonprofit work. Um, I want to thank my sister Greek over here, Miss White, for all the work she does because I understand it. And I was on the front line doing similar work. Um, and I would get clients uh, who needed things. I I worked for Greenville Technical College and we had a food bank for students. And if you know anything about technical colleges, um, there's a lot of non-traditional students. And um, we would you know, get these students who were single mothers or new time mothers or you know, transplants from other places. They you know, came to Greenville from places like Greenwood and they don't have anyone and they don't have anything. And they would say, you know, Ms. Grant, please you know, help me with this or that. And I say, I would do my best. And then I would come up on an issue, um, a roadblock, if you will. Um, things that are legislated. Uh, you know, the, the cutoff, they were 50 cents above the cutoff, so now they can't get assistance. Um, because of, you know, issues from their past, they may not qualify for housing. Um, they don't qualify for whatever reason for, you know, any financial assistance from the school or the school gave them as much as they could and then they're, they're stuck. Um, all of those things just really made me angry <laughs> and frustrated and so I started volunteering. I've always been a Democrat uh, since I could understand what politics was. I've always wanted to be involved. Uh, and then I started volunteering with the party and then I also started volunteering um, to really organize in my community. 
Um, that led me to meeting some amazing people like our um, current chair, Eli Valentin, um, who said to me um, during the presidential election of uh, 2019, um, you should work for, you should, you should come work for Kamala. And I was like, I don't have any political experience. He's like, it doesn't matter. You're really, really amazing and passionate and articulate and I think you'd be a great fit. Uh, and lo and behold, I thought nothing of it. I put my application in and just stopped thinking about it because, you know, I was so deeply impressed by her. I was like, surely I don't qualify. Um, then I got that call back and uh, worked for Kamala Harris uh, for the people in the 2019 presidential cycle uh, until she uh, then withdrew. Um, went from there to uh, the coordinated campaign for Jamie Harrison um, and really just kind of been rock and rolling with, with politics ever since uh, because I really cared about what happened um, not only in my own community but the communities uh, of the people that I would see all the time and I wanted their lives to be better and it didn't matter to me how long it took and what I had to do uh, I was going to do those things so that's that's kind of the long-winded version of why I wound up in politics. So you've worked with the Kamala Harris campaign. Did you get to meet Ms. Harris herself? Multiple times, and so did Elijah. <laughs> Very lucky. <laughs> oh, Very an lucky. Amazing woman. Very lucky. She's so amazing. happy she's our vice president. Yes. And and then you worked with Jamie Harrison. And I also understand you then. You know the election's over. Yes. It's now you know late November. Yes. And you still weren't done. What did you do after that? So I went to work for John also. <laughs> Because I have this fire in my belly and I said, you know, this, you know, the, for everybody in this room, everybody knows how much we invested into that race, right? And it was such an unprecedented race with Jamie. We, you know, were able to do some amazing things. And so that stung a little, you know? And I, I, I just could not leave dejected. I was like, we can make this happen in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can do something to make it happen, then, then that's what I'm going to do. So I went and continued on, uh, you know, worn for wear, but went on to the John Ossoff campaign and, and helped them, you know, over the finish line. So. And, and thank you so much for that. <laughs> I, I sometimes wake up in a cold sweat just imagining, <laughs> what if John Ossoff had not won that Senate seat in Georgia? What if Reverend Warnock had not won that Senate seat in Georgia? Things are tough enough with mansion and cinema, you know, block and things, and what little gets done is done despite them. But if we didn't have Ossoff and, and Warnock as well, man, I don't know where we would be. Yeah. I do not know. Um, I wanna bring up a, a quote you had mentioned, and, and you, you talked about this a lot, especially as you're a co-chair of the Single Parents Caucus. You mentioned single parents kind of being set up as second class Citizens, Can you expand on what you mean by that? Yeah, so um, when I was in school and I was in sociology, um, I heard a quote from my sociology teacher that has stuck with me forever, which is that um, being a single parent, but a spe specifically a single mother, is a permanent underclass, which basically means that their ability to rise out of poverty becomes 10 times more difficult than a person without children and, and or with a partner in poverty. Um, and I looked it up and it was, it, it like stuck with me because at that point, you know, I'm rocking a baby trying to get my degree. Like, are you telling me that it, this, this is my fate, that I will never be able to la rise above a certain level? And I know that it's because there are so many roadblocks for single parents. I and ro roadblocks, but yes, shout out to roadblocks. Um, but it was one of those things to where I was like, that, this can't be something that I just allow to just kind of sit on my spirit. I have to make, you know, a way to at least advocate for and shine a light on what it is like to be a single parent and what resources that they are going to need because um, it is because of so many other different factors, whether it be childcare, whether it be, you know, access to, you know, higher education, um, it is extremely difficult for some parents to rise out of um, poverty when they are single parents. So it is something that I'm really passionate about. And, you know, we hear from the other side so often that they want to blame all of our economic woes on the lazy poor, you know, and, and if, People would just work harder, you know, we would be better off. And yet I'm hearing 
that there are for a large portion of our population, people who work their tails off. Absolutely. And still, with the roadblocks put in their way, the obstacles that are set in front of them still can't move ahead. I mean, if, you know, wealth was equated by hard work, single parents, single mothers would probably be billionaires, you know? <laughs> Um, there are so many people who work 40 hours who are barely making it. Um, they work 40 hours a week, sometimes more, and they're not able, because we refuse to raise the minimum wage, um, because of all of the, the issues that you know you come across because we won't expand Medicaid and Medicare, um, we just, we wind up with all of these people that are doing the very best they can that cannot push past a certain point. So um, I, I would dare anybody who says that, you know, the working poor to, you know, come take a walk in my shoes and, and, and take a minute to think about how many people that I know that work so hard um, and are barely able to make ends meet or barely able to, um, to, to make a, a stride in terms of progression um, because there's a legislation that is keeping and impeding them from doing so. I'm gonna ask you one final question. Um, I read something you wrote, and this this paragraph hit me hard. Okay. All right, so here it is. Be ready, be ready to answer for it. Okay. You wrote, although there are times that our passions run high, it is imperative that we do the necessary work of starting these conversations and have them frequently. I often notice that no one wants to challenge or be challenged. At times, we are so bogged down in the status quo of political correctness, we fail to have real conversations, transformative conversations for the sake of collaboration and working towards a greater good is how great things get accomplished. And, and that really hit me hard because the idea of having difficult conversations about getting into our discomfort zone. I was on an interview with the great Cheryl Morton uh, just last week, and we talked about, you know, people who are a little more timid. You know, oh, I don't want to post something on Facebook. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, to be at a rally. I don't want to be seen. Uh, you know, I, I, I fear, and I felt that initially as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you got to step out because things aren't going to change if you're going to be afraid. But the more people that speak out, the less afraid we can be. Absolutely. Um, you know, putting myself out there was, was hard. Um, but I had to have a real honest conversation with myself about um, who are you waiting on? Why are you waiting on someone else to do this? Um, the, the worst thing that people can say is like they don't like what you have to say, but this is my truth. This is my truth and this is the truth of many people that I love and people that I've served through community work and I want their stories told. And I want their, their, the unique beauty of their lives to be valued and appreciated. Um, and there's not gonna be those conversations if somebody's not brave enough to step up and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what has happened to me. This is what I've lived through. But this is also what my neighbors are going through. And they deserve their voices to be heard. Well, thank you, and uh, I also want to welcome your son. His name is Elijah. <laughs> Elijah from the Bible. <laughs> yeah, Elijah from the Bible. How yes. you doing? I'm nine years old. Yes. Yeah, we also have um, running for U.S. Senate, Crystal Matthews, and, and she runs around oh, you know, she, bragging was, about her kids. Yes, I love that. And, and now she brings her kids to the state house floor, yes. and she says she dares anybody to tell her not to bring them. Exactly. And so, you know, that this is one of the realities of being a single parent. Um, I knew that, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me here. But uh, this morning, babysitter just dropped out. And I said, oh. we're going to go. We're going. I'm not canceling. And, I, you know, we're going to make it work. So, um, again, thank you so thank very you, much. Thank you, Tamisha, very much. <laughs> Any questions for Tamisha before we let her go? All right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.